What is up, down and sideways, you absolutely stunning individuals? It is Liga Unlocked. That is Mark. I am here. And it's finally here. It has arrived. Worlds 2024. Day one play in stage action. An absolutely immaculate hype video leading into this one to get you jazzed up. Uh, unfortunately, I was kind of pulled back a little bit when you again realize it's in the LEC studio, but the hype leading up to. Five out of five, double thumbs up. Oh yeah, happy with the hype video. I think that they hit all the notes that you really wanted to hear from it, talking with the different players for the teams and everything else. And then, yes, we are smack right in the face with the LEC studio. And for anybody familiar with that type of setting and background, not necessarily the, the spot that you wanna see, that transition, that changeover into the play-in stage to fully welcome you into Worlds, the gameplay on the rift absolutely welcomed you right back into the play and stage of world and what we were welcome to and waiting to see is what's this new patch gonna look like we haven't seen any games on this patch it's supposed to be the post 80 carry lane swap meta but mad lions and vikings we get a lane swap in both games early on and really Viking Esports did not seem prepared for it as Mad Lions got heavily advantaged in both of these lane swaps and both of the games in this series were getting Syndra versus Orianna, which I feel like is going to be the uh, real looking forward to the meta moment. Yes, this is the big change and the big shift that I think a lot of people had their eyes on when they saw the patch notes come through and, and feeling you know where we were with the meta and what was going to happen. Syndra was a major champion that a lot of people were looking at. One of the biggest uh, power spikes I think that we're going to see at this event is that champion and what she can provide for teams and how different that is. The Orianna as well, bringing in more of those, you know, control mage type of things into the mid lane. Still does not get rid of that lane swap meta that you talked about. I think that one of the things that a lot of people kind of talked about was that, you know what? Yes, you're adding in that extra resistance, extra you know, uh, health and tankiness of these towers, it's not really the problem here because not necessarily, you weren't really going for the towers on that lane swap. It was more so getting out of bad situations, getting champions that wanted to hit that mid game power spike, but had a really difficult, you know, early game conditions to get there. Get them out of there. Those conditions don't matter. You scale up and now we've got what we wanted in our composition. That was the key. And I think that is exactly why we saw the lane swaps in this series. And obviously, uh, Mad Lion's absolutely in control throughout this series, but maybe not piloted uh, as cleanly as you would hope to see because they got those advantages from the lane swaps, but as soon as, you know, they had to move around the map, have different macro, it took 37 minutes for this, them to win this first game. It really had no business being that long, but obviously the two standout performers were both El Yoya, and you can throw the whole bot lane. Both Alvaro, Alvaro and Supa were fantastic in this series. And for whatever reason, Vikings just let them get the exact same comp, except they sub in the Rel for the Nautilus in game two. And I know it's not always the most of a power pick, but after seeing that game one and seeing that, you know what? El Yoya has showed up. He's going to be the leader for this Mad Lion squad. Maybe we take him off of something like the Nidalee, giving him that power, that freedom, that type of speed in his clear was not a good option for Viking Esports. And then you keep going through this one because it, you know, in game one, we had a little bit much of that back and forth, even with more so the control in favor of the Mad Lions core the whole time around. Sloppy plays, a forcing, you know, just a little bit too much type of things at times, getting caught, you know, overstaying. These type of things were where Viking was able to punish, but when it came down to any of the important team fights, you gotta look at the mid lane for Viking and talk about Kati, his positioning, the way he's getting Oof. caught out in so many of them. It just was an absolute killer to any of these team fight chances for Viking. The amount of times you saw an impactful Oriana Shockwave in this series was like a single solo kill on Supa? Like th that's about it, the whole series. I, I was even going to exclude that one because it didn't end up accounting for anything yeah. in that type of situation. It's the only type of damage that you put through with it. That was a disappointing performance. And one of those ones where I think we can talk about this one from both sides and say, yes, 
a slightly sloppy, you know, some mistakes still coming through that we have seen from the Mad Lions Koi, but overall, you're giving them at least that, you know, one, maybe one and a half of that check mark to say that you got across this finish line. We saw some impressive things. We saw El Yoya be the leader for the team, mentioning the bot lane having good performance as well. And then on the side of Viking, you're only probably getting that half check mark because you found ways to get a little punch back, to get a counter push in this type of situation. But so many times, critical failures at critical moments, and especially from a player that you have become dependable on in Kati for this team, was a very disappointing thing to see. And yeah, obviously those counter attacks, pushbacks were getting a Baron when Mad Lions are completely in control and just kind of a lapse in back timing and stuff like that. So plenty to shore up for Mad Lions, but it's still a pretty convincing 2-0 advancement for them. And this is with, we talked about Mirwin's got to cook. That's the way for MDK. My man played two straight Cassante games and honestly, he didn't look that comfortable on that pick. He might have just been making a statement saying, I, I can't even play Cassante. I, I got to play Nidalee. I got to play something else. Uh, but Eloia makes a joke about, I had to look good on Nidalee so that Mirwin doesn't play it. And this is case in point. The crowd doesn't even laugh. I thought it was a great joke. Oh my God. I thought that was perfect coming through it that type of way. Less than perfect is the Cassante gameplay that we saw from Mirwin. I'm not a fan of Cassante. I don't know if there really are too many fans of Cassante at this point in time from what we have seen at the professional level. Needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Still a player that you're looking at for more. So the interesting picks, the uh, uh, unique champions to come through and be that difference maker in the top side for Mad Lines wasn't necessary today. And maybe that's going to be something that we see with this change in the meta and the, and the champions that we have talked about in the mid lane and, and what's going on. Maybe Mad Lines get a little bit uh, extra creative with something going there. And I hate to be a Debbie Downer in day one, but one more point on the crowd because MDK is a hometown. They are the host EU squad at this playing event. And I'm accustomed to at Worlds when it's the home team playing these matches. It's deafening. People are cheering when they kill a ward. When they find a pink ward, people are losing their minds. And there was... None of those types of cheers for them. Again, that El Yoya interview afterwards, it was almost silent in there. And I can't believe it, especially after the year that we have had in the LEC, Carmine Corp, the Blue Wall, and how crazy they have been. And then how that's been matched by the Mad Lions Koi, by the rest of the LEC, realizing that they got to take their fanaticism to that next level to match it, to be loud, to be supportive. We've seen that in the LPL, the LCK. Anytime it's in those regions, absolutely the crowd is a factor in having that motivation, that little bit of extra energy poured in for these great plays. Even the LCS, when we've had it in America, even when we're getting our booty cheeks smacked by any team, minor region, major region, anything goes right for the LCS, you better believe that we're screaming and cheering for our boys. I got to see that from some of the LEC fans. Luckily... If you wanted to chant for TSM, you could do it in PSG because you had TSM Maple showing up on the day. But this was uh, the spicier series on the day, primarily because you had this first game where Pain Gaming is showing up in a big way. And it was PSG kind of going in the Wayback Time Machine, forgetting that it's a new patch. We're getting Tristana mid, we're getting the Rumble, and this was obviously, I don't know if it was them trying to flex, like maybe we can just play the old stuff and it'll still work, but uh, yeah, it didn't work. I, nothing was working in that game one for PSG. It was all, excuse me, pain gaming, finding their way, finding that pressure, and getting on the board early was a big part of it, and then they managed to keep it going through that mid to late game is one of the big things that you wanted to see from Pain Gaming or you expected that pushback from PSG. That expected pushback comes in game two. And that comes courtesy of Mr. TSM, Mr. Flash Wolves Maple coming online and saying, you know what? Okay, the meta has changed. Let me roll with something a little different. And... He looked uh, very good on the Akali in both of these games. Obviously, game two ends up being a complete stomp the other way uh, in the favor of PSG. But people, obviously, in Classic World's tradition, completely overreacting. And listen, Junkie had a horrible game one. 0-5-0 on the Skarner. He was 
borderline inting a lot of these moments and everyone's going this is the hyped up jungler the mvp from the psg or from the pcs region but yes bounces back in a huge way in that second game it's basically a complete flip uh we get different meta picks out of PSG. They carry that momentum uh, into the third game, but we had some incredibly spicy moments in this series. You had that game one Baron, I don't even want to call it a flip. Everyone's just staring at the Baron at 1500 health. There's no smite on either team. Somehow Payne is able to clutch it, and then you've got uh, Cheetan very excited, and you know, he's in classic CBLO fashion. High-fiving in the middle of the match, of course, uh, he ended up having to eat those words in this third game but PSG looked like it should have been a clean closeout in that third game we get the vein top they finally cook up a little something but even that was a little messy at times yeah pain finding their moments and capitalizing on some mistakes yeah. some questionable uh, choices on the side of PSG while PSG had more so the control of this game it comes down to the last dragon fight where everybody again kind of like the Baron is just letting this thing live forever, fighting it around. In a 4v5 right? after your 7-0 and Akali just got caught out. Yes, that's the important thing to shout out because Maple was fantastic again in this game three until that moment getting caught out down in the bottom lane. And then it leads to this prolonged fight around the dragon. Dragon's living forever. Problem is, if we're waiting for the dragon to go down, there's a vein top lane that is just tumbling around in this river, making sure that, you know what, by the time the dragon's ready to go down, there ain't gonna be nobody left. I'm pretty sure 50% of Aji's damage to champions was in that final team fight where he uh, ends up cleaning up a triple kill because yeah, he has the flank and uh, it's just two moments in one series of this bizarre, everyone's staring at an objective, just kind of waiting for the other person to pull the trigger. At, trigger. I know that one was soul point, but uh, Jin Kato definitely got outmatched in the last two games in that Maple head-to-head. -head. The timeless wonder heading into decade number two as a professional player, deservedly so, he picks up MVP for this series. Oh, last dance maple picking up mvps Ooh. i'm sm i'm smelling a long run for psg it's coming up it's a possibility i know people are going to be all over the place with the results of this series because it seems like so many times you know people take it one or the other way right they take it okay this is the lesson i want to be hyped and learn about these play-in squads find something positive about it the other side there's a lot of people waiting to knock you down, to hear about, oh, you were hyped about this type of thing. You thought they're they're not for real. They're pretenders. I know what's good, that type of situation. And they're ready to tell you that PSG, oh, you, you, you see how they did against Pain Gaming in game one? No way. They are a real deal threat to contend later on in the event. I'm telling you, don't write them off at this type of situation. I think this is absolutely one where it was a slow start, some mistakes, underestimating your opponent type of situation for PSG quickly rectified by the team in that break between game one and two and shown the power all the way through the rest of this series and on the same side of that coin it's true about pain gaming where they showed up to play and brought a higher level of play and of incompetence than a lot of people were expecting from them against the intended uh, or the expected favorites here of the play-in stage yeah despite being so behind at times in game three a couple pixels away we're paid gaming. You're talking about a 13 HP soul dragon smite that they just missed. And then uh, the arrow that's so close to nailing the timing on Maple's TP. If that arrow hits him square on, he probably dies immediately. And that team fight plays out completely differently. Absolutely. Absolutely does. And it's just one of those ones where it's the slightest. The Less slightest than of a windows. second. Oh, it hurts. It hurts to think about that one. Pain, you got to regroup in this type of situation. You got to find a way to kind of wash away some of the bad, still focus on, okay, well, maybe these are mistakes that we want to focus in on, but take the positives. Take this as, you know, the win that you had in that first part of the series and move that into your next game against Viking Esports, a team that is going to be looking to make a lot of changes, I believe, after the way that series went against the Mad Lions. Yeah, I think after seeing the initial best of three, Pain absolutely should be the favorites in that loser's bracket matchup. Are we feeling better or worse about the MDK versus PSG matchup now after seeing a couple of games as we did before the tournament started? 
It's both. It, it, it's both. I hate to be the guy riding the fence in this situation, but it has to be because you're looking at the Mad Lions and what went right. You're talking about El Yoya and that bottom lane, finding their success, whether you're talking about Supa being that carry, being able to pilot that jinx and getting it through that, you know, early game, finding that mid game power spike and making sure that he is that hyper carry that this team needs to, to have that damage output as well as Alvaro helping support him, making the big plays down in the bottom lane, making the big plays when he's not with Supa, when he's teaming up with Mirwin and everything else going on in this game. And on the side of PSG, you are saying, well, Maple is timeless. He is still here. He is still that guy that's able to be that thorn in the side of T1 all those years ago. This is the TSM Maple that carried a lifeless TSM squad as far as he was able to. And now he has come back and he has been the leader of this PSG team this final dance time around. And he is not skipping out on his performances. Yeah, that's the matchup you're terrified of is the Frescawi Maple one, whether it's on something like Akali, some of these other mages. I mean, Maple was great on the 80 carries as well. This guy, to be as good as he has been for so long, you have to be able to adapt to new metas. And Maple has shown that time and time and time again. Uh, you know, Aji pulling out the Bane in game three makes me think, there's no way Mirren's locking in a Cassante opposite a Bane or even the Nara. You know he's going to have something ready. He's not. He's off Cassante duty. I'm, I'm calling it here. If, if he's rolling Cassante duty, if it is just stock standard in the top side in the draft for these Mad Lions, done and dusted already. Because I think that that needs to be an edge that you have to have this unpredictability, this little change, this little wrinkle in what is the expectation for PSG. That's got to be there for me for the Mad Lions. Before we get to these winner and losers brackets in the A side of things, we got to get to day two action, which is, of course, the B side. Fully part of all the teaser and hype is, of course, 100 Thieves will be making their debut. Gam on the other side. But, uh, you know, 100 Thieves versus R7 is a, a big miss, not a mismatch, but 100 Thieves are going to be big favorites in this one. But listen, R7 has no shortage. They have more international experience than 100 T. So it's really about how are the nerves for this team with four players making their international debut. And that is going to be a crucial thing with this 100 Thieves team. Again, the expectations are about as low as they possibly could be for this team at this point and what people are expecting, even with... That expectation being you're an LCS team, you're a third seed, you should be able to prove that you are enough to get through this play and stage. That's going to be the real test for this 100 Thieves because if their nerves are not there, if they struggle, if it's a slip up at the beginning, it's going to be difficult to make that climb up for this team to find that type of confidence. And we know confidence is a major part in how this 100 Thieves teams play, how things go well for this team specifically. Our boy, General Sniper, up in the top side. He is going to be a crucial part for this team. And this matchup against R7, we got it. Your boy Summit up there in the top side. Certainly going to be a real test for him and a real check on how you can do at a world's event. And, you know, outside of Sniper, we kind of touched on this a bit, but Quid should be the best player on this entire side of the bracket and should be right there with Maple in terms of best players at this stage of the tournament. That's the thing. And that's the one of those things that is, you know, kind of is that uncertainty still, I think, with Quid is that you know that that talent level is there. Is the execution going to be there when it matters in these type of moments? We have seen that in the LCS that he has been able to be a clutch player at times for this 100 Thieves team. He has been able to be that leader of sorts on the rift for the team. That's going to be a key thing that I want to keep track of here for these 100 Thieves, whether he is able to step up, he's able to take a confident lead and a confident step forward for this team on their stage games. You know 100 Thieves are dropping a game at least though, right? Against R7, they've got it. Uh, it it's a classic uh, LCS strategy, but I think that this time around, I'm going all in. I'm going that the 100 Thieves, they got it figured out. It will be the 2-0. For the LCS this time. Uh, hey, I'd, I'd love to see it, but I could definitely see the angle that PSG took today. A head scratcher of a game one uh, before they bounce back for that reverse sweep. But uh, the other matchup, equally as excited for Gam versus the SoftBank Hawks, and especially because uh, Evie and the boys, you know, they're a hard team to gauge because they completely smurfed on the LJL during that entire split. And 
really beat up on everybody except PSG who beat up on them. So I'm very curious what their power level will actually be against a squad like Gamp. Very excited, very excited because I think this one right now for me is, is kind of a, you know, 55, 45, 50, 50 type of matchup is the way that I feel about this one heading into it. I need to see this play out really to get that full wraps understanding on exactly what teams, what type of player we are getting at this type of moment for both of them. I think the Soft Bangkoks will be coming in as the slight underdogs in this situation, but you laid it out, Envy and the rest of the crew. It was dominance outside of PSG is the way that they played out their year. And I think what we saw today from PSG, yes, a little bit uh, of a slip up, but overwhelmingly at the end of the day through games two and three, you saw that power, you saw that connection come through. That's gonna be the question. Do we see the same from the SoftBank Hawks or is it gonna be more of the old magic from the Gigabyte Marines? Do they have anything crazy cooked up, lane swap going on? This is absolutely one of the times that I'm I I IDing in on them and saying, give me something wacky. Give me the unique strategy that comes through to take your game to the next level. Kia is the guy to be doing that, of course. You heard him and Levi chatting it up in their little teaser that five years ago they were playing in EU at Worlds on this same squad. That's how long they've been running the VCS. And then, of course, you've also got Evi returning to the LEC studio for a little bit of home buff. Now he knows exactly what's going on in the studio. He's going to be showing the guys. You got the washrooms over there. You get coffee over here. That's where yeah, the 35 no fans hang out. And... <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but either way, I think that what we're looking at here for this next day of play-ins is going to be exciting because there is that uncertainty to these matchups. Yes, you might have someone you're favoring, but it's not to the degree that you think it can ever be overwhelming in this case, even if I'm taking the homer side of the of the 2-0 for 100 feet. I mean, all you have to do, look at Payne in game one. I know they didn't win the series, but showing that they can t contest like that opens up the opportunity uh, for upset for any of the other teams at the playing stage. It's just day one. We're just warming up for Worlds, but that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity-flip.